And for our first presentation, I am very happy to welcome Obliva CEO Ellen Donnelly to our studio in Lund, all the way from Boston nonetheless. Welcome, Ellen. Thanks, Cecilia. Thanks for the opportunity to present Obliva. Imagine you're a new parent. You had a son 18 months ago, and he's developing like all boys. And suddenly he gets a cold. And the cold lasts a little bit longer than colds normally do, and so you call to see your pediatrician. The pe pediatrician runs your son through a battery of tests and sends some blood for genetic testing. And a week later, he calls you with some unfortunate news. Your son's been diagnosed with Lee syndrome. It's a rare disease that you've probably never heard of, so he continues. Unfortunately, this is a muscle disorder, and your son will start losing his muscle function. His development milestones that he's hit, he will soon regress. He may have uncontrollable sobbing, vomiting. He may start to develop seizures. And it's unlikely he'll live past the age of 10. The physician continues that unfortunately there are, very, there are no approved therapies for this drug. And he'll put you in touch with some patient advocacy groups so you can meet other patients suffering. At Obliva, we're focused on developing medicines for patients suffering from Lee's syndrome and other primary mitochondrial diseases. Obliva is focused on becoming a global leader in mitochondrial medicine. And to do that, we are focused on becoming a leader in mitochondrial medicine. We can do that because we've been building the foundation to enable that goal. The first thing is we have an experienced team that's been working in mitochondrial medicine for over two decades. And that's a long time in this area because we haven't known much about mitochondria and the biology is just starting to evolve. Our CSO and founder, Eskil Elmer, and our CMO, Magnus Hansen, are, have both been focused on this for most of their career. Eskil runs a research lab that you can see at the bottom at Lund University, and Magnus is responsible for our development team at Medicon Village. We have full R and D capabilities, so we have a full lab and a development organization, and we also have the opportunity to build a commercial organization that will sell and market our drug if it gets approved. Something that also is unique about our company is we have a portfolio of assets focused on primary mitochondrial diseases. Our lead asset is KL1333. That started a pivotal study last year. Pivotal means that that could be the one study we need to run in order to get the drug to the market. NV354, our second program, is ready to start phase one, its first clinical study. Our company is publicly traded on NASDAQ Sweden, and in June of 2022, we raised 24 months of financing, um, SEC 200 million, that will take the company for two more years and allow us to read out our interim analysis for our lead asset. So you may ask me, what are these mitochondria you're talking about? So mitochondria are really important because they're in every cell in your body and they're responsible for generating the energy your cells need to do their job. Um, the number of mitochondria that you have in each cell is dependent upon how much energy that cell needs. So cells that need a lot of energy, like your muscle cells or your brain, they'll have many mitochondria. Um, another interesting thing about your mitochondria is that DNA comes from your mom. And mitochondrial DNA is a bit hard to fix. It, the proofreading mechanisms aren't the same as they are in your nuclear DNA. And so often if a mutation occurs, um, it won't get fixed. And so we'll see, we'll see diseases caused from these mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. These diseases are called primary mitochondrial diseases. The best way to learn about them is to go onto our website. We have a couple of videos there of patients and you can hear more from the patients about their diseases. But these are rare diseases. They affect about one in 5,000 individuals. So you may not have met anyone that suffers from a primary mitochondrial disease. Like I told you with the little boy, these are devastating, debilitating disorders. They do range in severity. Um, so some people um, live a, a normal length life with reduced quality of life and others like the, the children that get the disease often um, perish quite early. There are no approved therapies for the systemic disease. These patients are told they suffer from a primary mitochondrial disease and the only thing they can do is treat the symptoms. As I mentioned earlier, the organs that require the most energy are those that are usually impacted. Here you can see our portfolio of programs at Obliva. We have a portfolio of first-in-class therapies that target these diseases. Our lead asset, KL1333, is focused on treating adults that suffer from fatigue 
and muscle myopathy or muscle weakness. That study just started in December of last year and we call it the Falcon study. And I'll tell you more about that drug and that study in a few slides. The second program we have is NV354. That was developed by our research lab. Um, and our scientists came up with the NV354 concept and it's ready to go into the clinic as well. We also have a number of other early programs that we won't talk about today. So I mentioned mitochondrial disease and often people don't, haven't heard of it. And I think that's because everything has really evolved in the last couple of years. So we have a better understanding of the mitochondria and the science behind them so that we can develop therapeutics to treat those dysfunctional mitochondria. We also have a number of regulatory tools that are available to us that shorten our time to market and decrease our costs. Examples of these are orphan drug designation, which we have with our first compound, KL1333. This allows us repeated conversations with the regulatory authorities and one pivotal study before it can go for approval. We have things like fast track designation, pediatric rare disease voucher, and breakthrough therapy are all tools that we as a company can use in order to progress our assets and get them to patients more quickly. The other thing that's developing is we've got organized patients and organized centers of excellence. And so in each country, we have about two centers of excellence focused on mitochondrial disease. In the States, it's about the same, about two per state. And these centers see the patients that exist in that country that suffer from the disease. Um, and so that's nice because the patients are all coming into one point of care. Um, these patients are kept track of in databases, which help both our clinical studies recruit the patients, and then they make it easier for us to sell our drugs. We also have support from a number of patient advocacy groups. And unlike in some other rare diseases where there are many, many, many of them, in this area they've concentrated their efforts. And so in the U.S. we have a few very well-known and well-established patient advocacy groups. They help us recruit our patients, get the, get the word out about our studies. And then obviously if there's a therapy um, that it gets approved, they'll help with that as well. And we also have a strong internal position with our portfolio. We have first-in-class assets, as I mentioned, they're the first, the first ever with this mechanism. Um, we're in line with the competition in both areas, and we have a strong patent estate that protects our assets once they get to market. So all of this, the decreased risk, decreased time to market, and decreased costs really lead to a very substantial commercial opportunity. And I show here a market assessment that we did, and this is really a back of the envelope to try to see what do you need to believe for to hit a billion dollars in peak sales. And it's very, very feasible. So you have to assume that 50% of the patients get diagnosed, 50% of those get treated. And in this assumption, I've assumed that we're second to market after someone else. I've assumed a low price point of about $160,000 per year, and you can see peak sales here hit a billion. So a really nice place to be working as far as the commercial opportunity. So our first asset is KL1333. As I mentioned, this is being a, developed for adults that suffer from fatigue and muscle weakness. So when a patient comes to the clinic and says, I'm interested in being in this study, the first question is, what level of fatigue do you have and what level of muscle weakness? And the reason we chose these things is because they map to our mechanism of action, but they're also seen to be the most prevalent symptoms in this patient population. KL1333 modulates two enzymes that are involved in the mitochondria. They need to be at the right level. And so what KL1333 does is bring them back into the correct levels. Um, we've run a number of studies. We've actually dosed over 100 patients and healthy volunteers with our drug and have a very good understanding of the safety profile. We also have signals of efficacy with this drug in patients, which I'll show you in a couple of slides. That was very important for us to understand the dose that we need to use of the drug and whether it would be efficacious in fatigue and myopathy. As I mentioned, we started our study later last year and we have limited competitors in this space. Again, there's a large commercial opportunity. So here you can see some of the data that came from our phase 1b study. You can see the two endpoints that we're actually looking at in this ongoing study are represented here by two different scales. We have the fatigue scale, which you can see on the left. This is looking at a reduction of fatigue, so it's good to go down. Um, and you can see the patients treated with our drug KL1333 are the black bar, and the patients that were given placebo are the gray bar. Patients didn't know which drug they were be being given and they both look the same. So the site doesn't know either, either do we. That's called a blinded study. So you can see in this panel that the black group and the gray group performed very differently. 
there's a large separation. And that separation is actually big enough to be clinically meaningful. And so what I mean when I say that is it's likely that these patients knew that they were felt better from our drug. That's clinically meaningful. I feel a difference in my symptoms. The second panel that you can see on the right is an improvement in muscle function. And this is a th test called the 30 second sit to stand where you sit down and stand up as many times as you can within 30 seconds. Again, you can see a difference in these two groups. The patients that had our drug did better in this test. So that was also pretty interesting to us. That shows us that the muscle function is, is important and KL1333 may address that. We have some other data from this study. We showed an exposure effect relationship. And what that means is patients got more drug, they did better. So we know that in this next study, we might wanna give them a, more, a little bit more drug. We also showed target engagement. And the reason that's important is because that shows you that it's our drug that's doing what we think it's doing. It's not some random effect. So the nice thing about this program and one of the benefits of working in the orphan space or the rare disease space is that we can move quite quickly. So you see that our study started last year. We're looking forward to an interim analysis in the middle of next year. And the drug could be on the market, if everything goes well, by 2026. That's a pretty remarkable timeline to the market and to our patients who need this drug. The study, a few highlights. It's adult patients with systemic disorder. We're going to recruit 40 patients to an interim analysis. And in the end of the study, we'll have 120 to 180 patients total. They're going to receive medicine twice a day, and they're going to get it for 12 months. We're looking at their fatigue and their muscle weakness. These patients have a hard time coming into the clinic, as you can imagine, and they're often unable to get up. They might have a hard time taking a shower because it just takes too much energy. So most of this year-long study will be done at home with nurses coming in and helping the patients through the assessments. And that makes it a lot easier for both the patients to participate in our study and for us to get the study run quickly. Our second asset is NV354. This one's exciting because it came from the scientists in our lab. Um, they designed that. This is a pro-drug of succinate, which means we're using a technology to get the succinate into the cells. It has the ability to be disease modifying. And this one will treat the sun that I told you about earlier. It has great properties. It's orally bioavailable. It's brain, brain penetrant. And now we believe it's clinic ready. You can see some of the data here that we looked at to show that the drug will be impactful on mitochondria, um, impactful in Lee patients. Um, the middle shows you the high brain penetration that we see. You can see that it largely penetrates the brain. And then in the last panel, you can see the improvement in motor activity and weight in a model that's very relevant to this disease population. We have a great team here at Obliva excited to get this drug into our patients. I think we all have a wealth of experience in drug development and mitochondrial medicine. You can see Escular CSO and Magnus. CFO is Katarina Johansson. And then Dog Ness just joined us as our head of clinical operations to ensure that we get this study run on time. We're also supported by a strong board and scientific advisory board. This is really important because we, we can't do it all alone. We talk to our scientific advisory board multiple times a week, a month, um, and they really are our partners in this study. These are all experienced people in mitochondrial disease. Many of them see patients as well as do research, and uh, we've established a great relationship with them. The board you can see on the left, um, a great group of advisors that, that are really very impactful in the company's progression. We've been very busy. We're a small team, but I think we work hard. In December, we were pleased to have initiation of coverage by Kempen. In December, we also started our phase two global pivotal study. In January, we recruited DOG to help ensure that that study goes well. And in February, we got the great news that our US patent has been granted for our second compound, NV354. We also announced the incoming chairman, Edwin Moses, who was confirmed in an EGM as a director of the board. Um, and in March, we've started screening our patients. So we're now starting to screen um, patients in the Falcon study. So it's been an exciting couple of months. As I mentioned, we're focused on becoming a leader in global mitochondrial medicine. We're gonna do that with our experience team, our locations in Lund in Sweden, our full research and development capabilities, and our exciting portfolio full of assets. So I encourage you to continue with us on this journey and I look forward to the next opportunity to update you on our progress. Thank you.
So, Ellen, like you mentioned here, this is a, a horrible disease for the patients and for their families. And I know that you have a lot of contact with patient organizations. What have you learned from them? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the patients are why we're all here. So we spend a lot of time talking to the patients, both to understand their disease, and then that allows us to better plan our clinical studies and the endpoints that we're going to look at. And so in our discussions with patients, it's been very interesting because the patients, the adult patients in our current study, they might suffer from seizures, strokes, they might be deaf. But when you talk to them, the thing that bothers them the most about their disease is their fatigue and their muscle weakness, because it impacts everything that they do during the day. They're always thinking, as you know, when you wake up tired, you're always thinking about how you just wish you had a bit more energy. And so because of our mechanism of action, we could actually design a study that looks at energy in the form of fatigue and muscle weakness. So that was really helpful. And then obviously with the children, with the second asset, targeting the, the young babies, it's just devastating to hear what these parents are going through. They often have to stop working um, and are the sole caregivers of those children. And they know there's nothing that's gonna make their child better. So it's just a matter of time. It's just keeping every day to be as impactful as they possibly can and seizing the opportunity to be with that child for one more day. So the patients really are why we're here. Um, we're all driven to get these medicines out to these patients and help them feel better. And that's, of course, what the aim of this ongoing study with your lead candidate is. But with primary mitochondrial diseases being so rare, how difficult is it to fully recruit a study like yours? Yeah, it's a great question. It, it could be very difficult. So we have a lot of sites that we're activating in order to find these important patients. Um, one of the things that helps us in primary mitochondrial diseases is these mitochondrial centers of excellence. So there are a couple in each country, and they see the patients that we need to get it into our study. And so we're hoping with the partnership with those sites that we will be able to recruit this study, but it all is always difficult. And as you know, if you're a patient suffering from a disease, it's hard to do a clinical study. It's a lot of work and we have a 12 month study that we're looking to recruit. So we don't know, we won't know until we start recruiting our patients. Looking at the, the other end of the study when you do get the data, what data do you need for it to be deemed pivotal? Yeah. Um, that's a great question, and that's really up to the discussion with the regulators when we take the data to them. We'll take the full data set. We'll have our two primary endpoints, fatigue and myopathy. Hopefully one of them is statistically significant. Then we'll have our secondary endpoints and our exploratory endpoints. And the regulators, they really look at that whole package. They see this incredible unmet need. I mean, these boys are, are dying, boys and girls and adults dying from this disease and they have no approved therapies. And so they look at that whole picture and say, okay, is this drug going to be efficacious and safe and should we get it approved? And that's the decision that they make. And let's say that it is deemed pivotal, you get it approved. What happens then? Do you take it to market on your own or do you look for a partner? Uh, yes, I, both are options. Um, I think it. Uh, our current plan is to marketed ourselves in the US. It's a fairly simple thing to do in a rare disease because you have these centers of excellence and you know where to target your sales. Um, and then we would probably partner in Europe just because that is a more complex environment with a different regulatory structures in each country. Well, I hope to have you back in Lund soon to talk more about Obliva. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. And thank you for coming.